Mira bien, hijo de tu puta perra madre. A mí me pela la verga el mencho aquí. May 15, 1992, Chalino Sanchez was handed a death note and with tears pouring from his eyes he gave his final performance as he knew that the long arm of the cartel had finally caught up with him. So here are 10 times celebrities messed with the wrong cartels. Yossi Locote April 19, 2018, the lifeless body of 42-year-old rapper Yossi Lakote was discovered in an empty lot in Guadalajara. The gruesome scene revealed a screwdriver brutally stabbed into his chest, accompanied by a chilling note from the CJNG. Born January 20, 1976 in Bakersfield, California, Lakote's journey to fame led him to Guadalajara, where he joined a street gang and pursued a rap career. His notable songs, Palazos and Esto Es Serio, opened the door to fame making him one of the most renowned rappers in the country. People regarded him as an OG, fearlessly narrating his real-life experiences on the streets, providing an unbiased and truthful account. However, his gravest mistake was aligning himself with one of CJNG's most dangerous adversaries, known as El Cholo, a formidable criminal and drug boss. September 2010, Mr. Yossi's trajectory took a tragic turn when he signed with the U.S. rap label Circulo Asesino, releasing his first record, 13 Hood Rules, in 2012. The Florence 13 gang sought to expand its influence in Guadalajara, intersecting with the CJNG, a relatively new and chaotic force causing mayhem in the city at the time. He was originally associated with Florence 13 in LA, engaging in illicit activities including drug trafficking and orchestrating numerous killings. To fully understand the tragedy that befell Lakote, it's essential to grasp a fundamental fact of the Mexican criminal underworld. Entities like street gangs and cartels typically operate in distinct territories, rarely encroaching upon each other, and crossing these lines can lead to disastrous consequences. Unfortunately, Lakote paid the ultimate price. April 17, 2018, Lakote was kidnapped from a local market in Guadalajara, which seemed like a meticulously orchestrated abduction. Two years later, his body was found and reports claim that Lakote was repeatedly stabbed with a screwdriver. Recognizing the rapper's influential presence in the area as a major catalyst for Florencia 13's rapid growth, the CJNG aimed to destabilize the gang and pave way for their dominance. This brutality was intended not only to end his life, but to send a chilling message to anyone continuing to support El Cholo. Steven Seagal in 1988, martial artist Steven Seagal took Hollywood by storm with his martial prowess, leading him to debut in Above the Law. Success would follow with his breakthrough role in 1992's Under Siege, showcasing not just his combat skills, but also a versatility as an actor. In reality though, he's not as tough as he is on screen, but is a real martial arts maestro. His journey from Japan as a martial arts instructor to Hollywood action star is nothing short of fascinating. Born April 10, 1952 in Lansing, Michigan, Seagal's fascination with martial arts ignited in his teenage years. He delved into Aikido, a Japanese martial art focusing on redirecting energy. Before gracing Hollywood, Seagal dedicated his early adult life to teaching martial arts in Japan. He even became the first foreigner to operate an Aikido dojo in Osaka earning respect and rising through the ranks. However, Seagal's Hollywood journey wasn't that smooth. His producer, Julius Nasso, had ties with the Gambino family. According to reports, the once thriving relationship between Seagal and Nasso became sour. When Nasso began to place insane demands on his income, he became a victim of extortion by the Gambino family. And when Seagal finally decided to completely sever ties with his former producer, Nasso sought revenge for the broken deal. In 2001, Seagal found himself forcibly abducted in Brooklyn. Facing life and death, Seagal decided to cooperate with the FBI. Wiretaps revealed the cartel's plans, corroborating Seagal's claims. This was crucial evidence that led to Nasso's guilty plea in 2003. Seagal's trust in the authorities not only saved his life, but also ended the dangerous game. Despite career setbacks, Seagal's martial arts skills continue to captivate audiences. His life has, however, not remained the same, and he remains on the run even to this date, constantly looking over his shoulder. Leslie Ann Pamela Montenegro 
February 5th, 2018, a tragic event happened in Acapulco, leaving many people in shock up until this day. The sudden death of famous YouTuber, Leslie Ann Pamela Montenegro, aka Nana Palucas. Now, she became famous in Mexico with her humorous videos about local politics while disguised in a heavy makeup and wig. She would use her platform to discuss corruption in politics and shed light on questionable dealings of local government officials, although in a more comedic fashion. And as she was gaining popularity, she began facing more and more threats of harassment for her bold comments. Alongside her rise to fame, the risk associated with her job grew even more. Her jokes about corruption and a comment she made about the Acapulco mayor being involved in a lot of drug deals made her a target. Banners immediately popped up in Acapulco, connecting her to a Facebook page that acted as a whistleblower and also as a member of a cartel. She began to receive a lot of threats over her social media accounts. But despite those threats, Leslie grew even more resilient in trying to expose the corruption in her country. And sadly, this is a choice that she paid for with her life. February 5th, 2018, she was mercilessly shot at her restaurant in Acapulco by unknown gunmen. And despite being rushed to the hospital, she unfortunately didn't make it. Her death had shocked many, and people started to worry about the safety of those speaking out against corruption corruption and the cartel. The investigation did link to a drug cartel, but doubts and questions about what happened remain. The attorney general claimed Leslie had sensitive information concerning some drug deals, but communication was cut off, leaving many unanswered questions like, who was the mole in the government, and what was the extent of their involvement in illegal deals? Her killers remain at large, and her case is still a mystery to this day. Ruben Ortega August 31st, 2022. The world was shaken by the tragic death of Ruben Ortega, widely known as Super Chinelo. A beloved YouTuber to many Mexicans, Ruben devoted his channel to sharing the vibrant culture and heritage of Mexico. His infectious enthusiasm and compelling storytelling quickly propelled him to celebrity status, capturing the hearts of both locals and global viewers alike. However, Ruben's ascent to fame drew the attention of notorious Mexican drug cartels, unleashing a chain of events that would lead to his untimely demise. Born on the 10th of September, 1992, and raised in Mexico, Ruben had a profound love for his country's rich culture and heritage. And because YouTube seemed like the cheapest way to reach a huge number of people, he would start his journey showcasing Mexico's beauty to the world. When he started the channel, the initial plan was to explore local markets, traditional festivals, and even the vivid sights and sounds that defined Mexican culture. His genuine passion and infectious charisma resonated with the audiences, propelling his channel to new heights. That intriguing mask became a distinctive element of his persona, contributing to his celebrity rise under the moniker Super Chinelo. Yet Ruben's impact extended beyond entertainment. He used his platform to shed light on vital social issues, collaborating with local organizations to raise awareness about environmental conservation, indigenous rights, and the preservation of cultural heritage. Beyond virtual initiatives, Ruben organized charity events and actively participated in community initiatives, making a tangible difference in the lives of those in need. But as his influence grew, so did the target on his back. Eventually, his humanitarian activity began to encroach on cartel territory. And then disaster struck. August 31st, 2022, Ruben was gunned down in front of his house. His wife had also sustained injuries. The loss of Super Chinelo left a huge void in YouTube entertainment, and fans had mourned the departure of a true cultural ambassador. Ruben's murder sparked outrage and reignited calls for justice in a country where impunity often prevails. His legacy lives on, inspiring others to embrace their roots and celebrate the diversity that makes Mexico unique. In the wake of his tragic death, Ruben's message of cultural pride resonates even more profoundly, emphasizing the power of social media as a force for positive change. Compa Jorge. In this video, we're going to do something different because I'm going to tell you a story that happened to me. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story of how they got raised. April 18th, 2022. Mexico stood still as local news reported the death of rising YouTube sensation Compa Jorge. It looks like he was out to grab a few things and shoot some new content, as he had discussed earlier in a video. Unbeknownst to him, though, he wasn't only sharing his plans with fans, but also to some people who wanted him dead. In July 2021, Compa Jorge became an instant sensation with straightforward vlogs and storytime content. Eventually, he would delve into showcasing his UTV collection, 
and high-end cars in Kuyakan. Living large in a city known for a flashy lifestyle didn't just attract viewers, but also from dangerous cartels who would silence these people with criminal acts like kidnapping and extortion. In 2021, Jorge opened up about a horrifying experience, a kidnapping by cartel members. This event left him deeply traumatized, prompting months of seclusion fueled by fear. He would even go back to the site of the incident in a vlog, sharing his lingering unease. In December 2021, after Jorge had been out with a friend, he decided to give him a ride back to their home. However, as he was driving, he had to pull over because he felt nauseous. And then out of nowhere, a man wielding a rifle emerged from this other vehicle, claiming to be a state agent. And before Jorge knew what was going on, he found himself robbed, hands tied, and blindfolded. He was interrogated about his income and insinuated that he had ties with a cartel. Despite vehemently denying cartel ties, Jorge faced both verbal and physical threats from his captors. And as the situation unfolded, he began to become even more desperate with his plea to his captors. He implored them that if they intended to to take his life, they should at least leave his body where his family could find him. And remarkably, the plea would resonate with his kidnappers. Perhaps feeling some kind of empathy or realizing the gravity of their actions, they decided to set Jorge free, untying his hands and removing the blindfold. They instructed him to wait five minutes after they leave before making his escape, a small act of mercy that allowed Jorge to regain his freedom. March 15th, 2021 marked the beginning of the end for Jorge. Following the success of the kidnapping story, Jorge shared a storytime video talking about the encounter with one of El Chapo's sons, which turned out to be the biggest mistake of his life, because that video sparked speculations about him being involved with El Chapo's son and immediately caught the attention of rival organizations. April 18th, 2022. As was custom, he vlogged his plans for the day as he left his house. But while he was on his way to his first location, a vehicle filmed with armed suspects pulled up in front of him. El Campo was shot many times before they sped away. The entire populace of people around this incident was thrown into a frenzy, and they immediately called for emergency services, who arrived about 10 minutes later. But while Jorge was being transferred to a rehabilitation clinic, he tragically passed away in the ambulance. The murder remains unsolved and his killers are out there running around. Sergio Verga June 27, 2010, famous narco corridor singer Sergio Verga was found dead in his car with over 30 bullets in him. His lawyer came out blaming this on car thieves saying he was a good man who didn't have any problems with the sort of people who carried out the organized hit. Now, the circumstances and timing of the crime suggest that he was probably taken out because he was entangled in one of the many ongoing turf wars between Mexico's drug cartels. Born September 12, 1969, Sergio developed a love for music growing up in a family of musicians. His musical journey began in the U.S., joining his brother's group in Phoenix. Following conflicts, Sergio took a bold step by forming his own group, Los Ros del Norte. Also known as El Shaka, Sergio wasn't only a gifted singer, but a true icon in the Mexican music scene. However, his involvement in the controversial narco corrido genre made him a target for cartels, ultimately leading to a tragic end. Now, this genre is known for its narratives about the lives of drug traffickers, which became Sergio artistic expression. While it did bring him fame, it would stir criticism as well for glorifying criminal activities. Sergio defended that by saying that his music was just a reflection of the harsh reality surrounding him. Despite the controversy, Sergio's popularity soared, drawing attention from record labels. However, success came at a price. His fearless approach to the genre made him a target for the cartels. These ruthless organizations known for control over the drug trade saw Sergio's music as a threat, which shed light on their illicit activities, he faced mounting threats, particularly when he embarked on a journey to perform in the perilous state of Sinaloa, a notorious stronghold for cartels. Despite being aware of the risks and traveling with a security detail, Sergio couldn't escape the relentless pursuit of the cartels, and on June 27, 2010, his vehicle would make its way through the streets of Sinaloa, and suddenly, armed men would ambush the convoy, unleashing a hail of bullets. The chaos erupted as attackers wanted to finish him off. His security detail fought back, trying to shield him. However, amidst the chaos, Sergio tragically fell victim to the ruthless violence of these cartels. The news echoed around the world, prompting reflection on the dangers faced by artists by confronting powerful criminals. His untimely demise served as a pognate reminder that even with the right precautions, individuals like Sergio were not immune to the perilous realities of the Mexican music scene. Chalino Sanchez
May 15, 1992, Chalino Sanchez had the death note in his hands during his final show in Mexico. Unsure of what would happen next, he began to do what he thought best, sing his heart out. Chalino was a renowned singer. However, the genre of his music and the events leading to his death tell a chilling tale that continues to resonate today. Born on the 30th of August, 1960, to poor parents in Cuyacan, Chalino had to do whatever to survive. He would take up odd jobs while in school, and because of his surrounding influences, it was difficult to stay out of trouble. He became this errand boy for some members of cartels until 1975, when his sister was actually taken and assaulted and then sent back home home in shame. Swearing revenge, Chalino learned that El Chapo Perez was involved, and four years later, he seized the opportunity at a party and shot Perez dead. This act forced Chalino to flee Sinaloa as Perez's men saw his face. He would then find his refuge in Tijuana, and immediately he made it his mission to help Mexicans cross the border until 1977, where he crossed into the U.S., settling in L.A., washing dishes, selling cars, and according to his friends, dealt small amounts of marijuana and cocaine, but he would also help out his older brother, Armando, run an immigrant smuggling operation. In 1984, Armando was shot and killed in a hotel in Tijuana, which inspired Chalino to compose his first corrido or ballad. Around this time, though, he was also arrested for his involvement in his brother's business, but he was released almost immediately. While he was in prison, he began writing narco corrido songs praising the lives of drug dealers. His unique style made him famous, and he returned to LA, recording music and performing at packed venues across the city. On January 25, 1992, Chalino was performing at the Plaza Los Arcos restaurant and nightclub in Coachella. As he began to perform, he would take in song requests from the audience. But shortly before midnight, Eduardo Gallegos, 32, a local unemployed mechanic who was under the influence, requested El Gallo de Sinaloa. Immediately afterwards, Gallegos jumped onto the stage and pointed a 25 caliber pistol at Chalino. In retaliation, Chalino pulled his 10 millimeter pistol from his waistband and this gun battle ensued. Chalino was hit four times while he missed his shot and killed an innocent bystander. He survived the shooting and, undeterred, Chalino sold the rights to his songs, using the money to secure a house for his family. On May 15, 1992, Chalino agreed to perform in Cuyacan, a city notorious for the Sinaloa cartel. Despite the risks, he played anyway, understanding that this show could be his last. As he performed, a fan handed Chalino a note saying that this would be his final act. After the show, armed men claiming to be cops stopped Chalino and his group. Chalino gave himself up, only to be found dead after 12 hours with rope marks on his wrists and two bullet holes in the back of his head. The mystery surrounding his death involves a potential revenge for a past murder and connections to the Sinaloa cartel. Suspects include anybody from the Sinaloa cartel and Eduardo Galos, plus other members seeking payback. There's no question that his association with the cartel may have made him a target, but the true motives remain unclear, adding a shroud of mystery to his untimely demise. Jocelyn Alejandra Nino on the 13th of April, 2015, Mexican authorities in Matamoros discovered Nino's dismembered body inside an ice cooler. This cooler was abandoned at a parking lot, and the body showed signs of torture, likely done to extract some information. Born in 1990 and raised in a small Mexican town, Jocelyn was raised in extreme poverty. Despite the hardships, though, her striking beauty made her stand out. The Gulf Cartel recruiters, always on the lookout for potential assets, had noticed her. They lured her in with promises of wealth and status, offering an escape from the struggles she had known. And now La Flaca started as a lookout, blending into the crowds while secretly gathering information. However, as time would pass, her involvement deepened. The cartel introduced her to the world of prostitution, a dark path she felt compelled to follow. She was then promoted to a foot soldier, with her unassuming appearance making her the perfect assassin, eliminating any threat to the cartel. However, her popularity would attract the attention of law enforcement. She became a wanted woman, constantly on the run, always looking over her shoulder. But despite the risks, La Flaca remained committed to the cartel. Maybe she thought she was untouchable. As she rose through the ranks, she became a trusted enforcer, leaving a trail of bloodshed. La Flaca would join the faction of the Gulf Cartel known as Los Ciclones, carrying out daring attacks on rival gangs. On April 12, 2015, La Flaca and her comrades were captured by a rival faction of their cartel, and then were 
tortured for a while before they were all shot in the head, with their bodies being completely dismembered and dropped into a cooler in the park to serve as a form of warning. The exact perpetrators of this brutal crime have remained unknown, but according to reports, maybe Los Metros had a hand in it. Juan Luis Lagunas Rosales December 18th, 2017, the lifeless body of internet sensation Juan Rosales, also known as El Pirata de Cuyacan, was discovered at a bar in Jalisco with bullet wounds and fractured bones. Now who could have wanted the rising star dead? Born December 19th, 1990, in the Mexican state of Sinaloa, the land of notorious drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, he would grow up in a modest family and not have a really easy childhood. But eventually through hard work he was able to build something for himself. He would live with his grandmother until the age of 15, when he dropped out of high school and left his hometown of Navolato, making Cuyacan his new home. He would start off by washing cars to make money, and by the time he was 17 years old, he made a very good living for someone his age, and people around him would be envious by the way he was making his money. But Rosales was a partier, and would post videos of himself drinking excessively. Most of the time in the videos, he was either drunk enough to pass out or on his way there. Sometimes he would actually just pass out. And strangely enough, his videos started going viral. In a particular video, Lagunas was recorded taking jabs at Nemesio Osegueda Cervantes, aka El Mencho, who happens to be one of the most feared drug lords in Mexico, and also the leader of the CJNG. Trust us, even El Mencho was probably shocked by this young man's audacity. In the video, he was with a group of friends, and as always, he appeared drunk and very enraged, and just started shouting and hurling insults at El Mencho, saying, El Mencho can suck my dick. When that video went viral, everyone knew that was the end for him. A few days later on Monday night, while he and his friends partied at a bar in Jalisco, a group of Sicarios busted in, guns a-blazing, and opened fire on Lagunas, hitting him with no less than 18 bullets. Authorities managed to arrive on scene at some point, but it was already too late. Nobody found the identities and probably knew the motives of the killers, but most of the evidence pointed towards El Mencho and the CJNG. Could be like finding a needle in a haystack, except this needle was practically waving a flag saying I did it. Illuminati 6 in early 2017, a guy simply known by his TikTok handle as Illuminati6 engaged his followers by accepting dares from him. Well, one user dared him to insult El Mencho, which he fearlessly did in a video. Wearing a loose black round neck and black ribbed jeans with a backpack, he leaned on a light pole and boldly stated, Listen well, you son of a bitch. El Mencho can suck my dick. He then added, I don't sleep like El Pirata or El Chanito de Cuyacan. And concluding the video, he declared, Aired. I'm untouchable. I made a pact with the devil. I came to give you fire, Mencho. I ain't scared to say this. I'll say it with the camera right here. El Mencho can suck my dick. When that video went viral on Reddit and Twitter, many speculated that he must have been a member of the cartel. To have such confidence in those words, while showing his face, all sorts of comments were flying around with statements like, RIP in advance. Surprisingly, no word was heard from El Mencho or even the CJNG. Rumors circulated that Illuminati 6 was wasn't based in Mexico, making it hard for the cartel to reach him. Reports suggested he lived in Richmond, California, further complicating the attack because he was in the United States. The CJNG didn't respond initially, but out of nowhere, the teen would upload a few days later another video apologizing to El Mencho for his earlier words. In this apology, he expressed regret, claiming he wasn't well or conscious of what he was saying that day. He acknowledged the mistake, attributed it to a quest for followers, and pleaded for forgiveness. Saying, I'm sorry for what I said, I wasn't well. I wasn't conscious of what I was saying. It was wrong. I woke up stupid. He continued by saying, I didn't look at the consequences. I did that for followers. I ask for forgiveness. You and your family are well liked. Please don't kill me. I have a family just like you. I apologize. We all make mistakes. I have psychological problems, sir. Just remember, we like you. The internet buzzed with discussions about this abrupt turnaround, with people wondering if El Mencho made a personal threat to the TikToker without everyone else knowing, or if this dude just snapped out of his TikTok fantasy and realized who he was talking to. We never found out what happened behind the scenes and his TikTok simply vanished, with the account being made private. No one can say for certain what happened to the guy. We could take a wild guess and say that maybe somebody killed him off silently. I mean, maybe.